Hello, everybody. Hello. Awesome turnout. There's a lot of people here. This is really cool. Excellent. Uh, so my talk today is, um, well, so if Jesus didn't exist, where did he come from then? And what, what is this? Well, let me explain. Uh, there's basically three competing theories uh, to explain uh, the origins of Christianity and Jesus' relationship to that. Um, the, fir the first of these, the, the, let's say the, the, the traditional one, is the Christian idea of historicity, that Jesus was an amazingly famous Superman who could walk on water and shit. Um, <laughs> the, the whole supernatural, uh, really super famous Jesus, uh, everybody knew him. Uh, there was celebrations in Jerusalem and, and all this kind of stuff. And the Gospels are basically true. They, they might quibble over some of the details, but pretty much uh, what the Gospels say is what actually happened. Well, most scholars actually in the field do not buy into this. This is a fundamentalist thesis. There are fundamentalist scholars that keep pushing this. Uh, but the reality is most scholarship is secular, even if it's not being practiced by secular scholars. There are a lot of Christian scholars who agree with this secular historicity theory. Uh, which is, like I said, this is kind of like the mainstream consensus view of Jesus historians, uh, is that Jesus was an ordinary nobody uh, whom no one noticed but a few fanatical followers. And that's why there's so little evidence of his existence is because he just wasn't really that famous. He didn't do all these amazing things. And only a few people knew him, and most of them were illiterate. And their, their view of the Gospels is that regarding Jesus, the Gospels are mostly fiction, uh, but there are a few kernels of truth in them, and if we can figure out the right method, we can kind of extract that information. And that's the mainstream view, that's the most common view. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is this new theory. Well, it's not really new, it's been around for a while, uh, but uh, it's been revamped and improved in the way that we argue for it and formulate it. And it's what I call secular non-historicity. And this is the view that Jesus was the name of a celestial being who is subordinate to God, basically an archangel, with whom some people hallucinated conversations. And that's how the religion started. And then later on, the gospel began as a mythic allegory about this celestial Jesus that was set on Earth, as in fact most myths were. If you look at any myths, whether it's Hercules, Romulus, or Osiris, a lot of these gods started basically as heavenly gods that were later put on Earth, and the stories are told about them interacting with in history on Earth. So this theory, this is, they're saying that this is uh, what Jesus actually was. This is how it actually started. Now, there are very few of us who actually advocate this. This is accurately described as a fringe position uh, I always say that it's, it's a hypothesis that just hasn't had a proper review yet. So I, I advocate people that don't go around hitting people over the head and say, no, definitely Jesus didn't exist. This really hasn't been properly vetted yet. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have a book coming out next year where I'm going to really try and make a, a formal scholarly defense of it uh, in, in a way that the scholarly community can take seriously and deal with. And then we can have a real conversation about how likely this theory is. Uh, nevertheless, I have people asking me constantly, well, what is this theory? Why do you think it could be true? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, uh, first thing to know is forget about all the other mythicist theories. There's tons of others, uh, conspiracy theories, Da Vinci Code stuff, um, all kinds of things like that. You'll, you'll see a lot of literature and a lot of claims about this that argue that Jesus didn't exist because, and then they fill in the blank with something. And a lot of that is very unreliable or very fallacious or factually wrong. So you have to be very skeptical when dealing with mythicist theories. Uh, and so I say, if basically, if you want a simple rule, if you don't hear it from me, be skeptical of it. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to start with an analogy. Two religions that we know fairly well, um, Islam and Mormonism. Uh, now I'll read these, these paragraphs, but you'll notice that the word hallucinates is in quotes, scare quotes. Uh, and that's because in these two cases, we have pretty good reason to believe that they were lying. Uh, that they only claim to have visions of these deities or these, these uh, celestial beings. Uh, but nevertheless, we do know for a fact that there are religious traditions that are started by genuine hallucinations of celestial beings. Of course, they're made up in their head, but they just don't know that they're made up in their head. Uh, in this case, uh, in fact, it was so popular, it's so effective to argue that I saw God and he told me this, uh, that Muhammad and Joseph Smith knew that it would be very effective for them to pretend to do this. So basically, it was advantageous for them to pretend to be hallucinating uh, in, from our perspective. So this is how it started. Islam. Muhammad, quote unquote, hallucinates conversations with the angel Gabriel, and the Quran records the spoken teachings of Gabriel. In Mormonism, Joseph Smith, quote unquote, hallucinates conversations with the angel Moroni, and seeing words on magical plates that no one else can see. And the Book of Mormon records what the latter two said. Now, I give these analogies so you can understand that the Jesus myth theory, the, the viable Jesus myth theory, is this is how the, the analogy works. 
Jesus was originally a celestial being just like Gabriel and Moroni. And he taught his followers in the same way, through visions and hallucinations, or what we would call hallucinations, what they would call visions. Then he was euhemerized. Now, euhemerization is named after this Greek author, uh, pre-Christian Greek author by the name of Euhemerus. And he did this neat little thing. He took the gods Zeus and Uranus, and he says, you know, these gods, Zeus and Uranus, they were actually kings that actually lived at a certain time. And he wrote a book, and he made up a whole story, basically like the Gospel of Zeus and Uranus, um, placing them in history. And this idea of doing this became very popular. A lot of Greek uh, philosophers and, and theologians after that started doing this to more and more gods. And it's called euhemerization. It's taking a celestial deity, putting him on Earth, and giving him an earthly story. And it happened a lot. It was, it's one of the most common things going on in ancient religion. And the idea was that stories were created that placed them on Earth, interacting with historical figures. And of course, you can pick the period. Uh, Romulus is, a, is an example. Uh, Romulus was supposed to be a founder of Rome. Uh, he's, he was a celestial deity, just an ordinary God in heaven kind of thing. Uh, so they put him in history. Where do you want to put him? You want to put him at the origin of the thing he started, which is Rome. So he's, he's set actually in you know, seven, the 700 BC. He's interacting with actual characters and, and, and lore about uh, the history of Rome. So the same thing would have been, could have been done uh, to Jesus, putting him at the origin of the religion and having him interact with characters that were around at that time. That's the theory. And then, of course, people started believing or selling those stories as true. And that's the version of Christianity that we have today. It already started happening by the end of the first century, definitely is going on in the second century, where there's tons of Christians who think these stories are actually true, that they weren't allegories or anything like that. Uh, and, or maybe they, don't, maybe they know the truth, but they're selling it as true. And there are particular political and sociological reasons why it would be to their advantage to sell it as a true story rather than an allegory. Okay, that's the theory. Why is this credible? I've got to give you some background teach you a little bit about ancient religion. And uh, one of the most important pieces of information you can learn is there were certain trends going on in Hellenistic religion. Now, Hellenistic means Greek after Alexander the Great. So before Christianity, there's basically three or 400 years before Christianity, is the Hellenistic period. And during this period, uh, religion is changing in the area, significant changes. And this author, Petra Pekenen, uh, in interpreting early Hellenistic religion is the one who documents uh, the four trends I'm going to talk about. There are four big trends in religion in the centuries leading up to Christianity. Christianity conforms to all four. And this is important to notice. These are them. The four trends. Syncretism. Syncretism is combining a foreign cult deity and its religious ideas with Hellenistic elements. Generally, syncretism is combining two ideas from different cultures and making a new thing. Uh, in this case, it's the Hellenistic Greek ideas, particular religious ideas, are being merged with the foreign, foreign non-Greek uh, religion to create a new religion that's a combination of both, a merger of both. And this is going on again and again and again. It's, it, was, it was all the rage in the centuries leading up to Christianity. The other is monotheism. You might think this is strange. Well, they're all pagans. They're polytheists, right? Well, no, actually, the Hellenistic trend was transforming polytheism into mon monotheism through an intermediary stage called henotheism, where there's one supreme deity and everything else is his subordinate, something that all the other gods are gods he created and they're in control. Uh, this sound might sound familiar to you. Uh, in the Christian and Jewish system, they call them angels. In the pagan system, they just call them subordinate deities. But it's the same system. They have the same powers. They have the same role in heaven uh, and that kind of thing. Also, henotheism, part of it was teaching that many gods were often different facets of the same gods. So like Osiris and Dionysus, you say, oh, that's actually, those are the same gods. They're just depicted with different statues and have different followers, but they're, they're both worshiping the same ones. So they're, combining gods into one, and then subordinating all other gods. And, and it was that trend going towards this, this monotheistic structure that was very similar to the way Christianity and Judaism actually were at the time. So there was much more in common with Judaism, Christianity, and paganism uh, than is often recognized because of this trend in Hellenistic religion. The third trend was individualism. Originally, a lot of these cults were agricultural cults. They're designed to keep the rains coming. They're designed to prevent famine. They're designed for the whole community to engage in activities that would save the whole community. It's community <coughs> for community. Well, what was going on during this period, the Hellenistic period, is they were becoming individualized. That agri agricultural salvation cults were being retooled as individual salvation cults, so that you personally would have a better place in the afterlife. And related to this is, and that might sound familiar, that sounds like Christianity, right? There were a lot of these Hellenistic religions doing this. Cosmopolitanism is related to that. 
This is the idea that all races, cultures, classes were admitted as equals with fictive kinship, you would call each other brothers and sisters, uh, and you would now join a religion rather than being born into it. Now we take that for granted, that religion is something you join. That's actually a novel development, and it was a development of Hellenistic religion at this time, and that's what Judaism and Christianity became, they became joining religions, but this is all reflective of the same trend that was going on in pagan uh, Hellenism at the time. Okay, so Christianity fits all of these. Let me give you some examples. Uh, there are the Eleusinian and Dionysian mysteries. Uh, these were combining Hellenistic elements with Phoenician elements, that's from Western Syria, to create a new religion. Uh, this was, these were Athenian, they'd be very popular in Athens in the south of Italy. These are all pre-Christian religions. Uh, the mysteries of Atras and Sibyl uh, combined Hellenistic elements with Phrygian, that's northern Turkey. Uh, different cultural elements creating a new religion that's a combined combination of both. The mysteries of Jupiter Dolicanus uh, combined Hellenistic elements with Anatolian, that's Western Turkey. And then mysteries of Mithras, or familiar as Mithraism, combined Hellenistic elements with Persian, that's religion from Iran. Then there's the mysteries of Isis and Osiris, combining Hellenistic elements with the Egyptian. Okay, keep going through here. Well, of all these cultures, people are creating new cults by taking a big, popular local culture, a foreign culture, combining with Hellenism. What culture has not done this yet? Judaism. And if you take those four trends and you inject them into Judaism, and you take some other elements that were common to all these other cults here that I'm talking about, and inject them into Judaism, you could predict, which before it even happened, you could predict almost every key element of Christianity. And that's what Christianity is. It's exactly this trend. It fits right into all of this. Instead of Egyptian or Persian or Anatolian religions being merged, it's Judaism being merged with Hellenism creating a new hybrid religion that explains most of the unique components of Christianity. One of these uh, familiar features uh, is not this, these weren't features of all of those religions, but there's a feature of many of them. And that's the idea of the dying and rising God. Now there's been a lot of bad literature on this uh, that made false claims or exaggerated claims. For many of the dying and rising gods, the evidence is ambiguous. For some of them, they weren't dying, they weren't dying and rising gods. But we have good evidence, I mean, conclusive evidence, I'd say, for enough of them to know that there was this trend. And these are the three, these are three of them for which we have the best, strongest pre-Christian evidence that they actually were gods that actually died, actually did come back to life, and salvation of some form would be related to that. Romulus. Romulus was a Roman state god. His death and resurrection was celebrated in annual play. People would act it out uh, annually. It was, so this is a very publicly known religion. Osiris, uh, he's an Egyptian god, and those baptized into his death and resurrection are saved in the afterlife. Does that sound familiar? Zalmoxis, a Thracian god, uh, his death and resurrection assures followers of eternal life. Sound familiar? Yes. So this, these trends were there. Um, and if you want to know more about these, you want to see the sources, the evidence, the scholarship, uh, my book, Not the Impossible Faith, will tell you about it, plus a lot of other background knowledge that's useful for understanding the origins of Christianity. Uh, this book doesn't argue that Jesus didn't exist, but it does give you a lot of the information that will lead to a lot of doubt in that regard. But let me correct you on one thing here. Mithra is not a dying and rising god. Uh, this is one you'll hear a lot, that Mithra, Mithras, uh, is one of these gods. Um, we have no evidence that he was actually dying and rising god. Uh, this, by the way, this uh, carving is like a unique piece of material. It's the Gospel of Mithras in cartoon form. Uh, so it's basically the picture Bible without the words. And we don't have the words. They don't survive. No one recorded the story. So we don't even know what's actually being depicted. We've been able to guess at some things. But one of the things we know is he undergoes some great struggle, a battle, a battle with a, a great bull. Uh, and he has to endure some suffering involved in that. And in the end result of which is that he can obtain eternal life for his followers. And we can reconstruct that much. Uh, but the similarity here is not that he dies and rises. The similarity is that he undergoes a passion undergoes a suffering and ordeal through which he gains victory over death. And that's, that's a similar component, again, to Christianity. So let's look at that. So all the gods in these mystery religions, and many mystery religions, I, I only named a few of them before. There are even more than we know uh, details of. All these gods that we do know about do have these things in common. They're all savior gods. They're all called savior. They're all the son of God. Some of them are daughters of God. There are, there are some, uh, some women in there. They all undergo a passion of some kind, some kind of suffering uh, that uh, leads to their victory over death. And that's the thing. They all obtain victory over death, which they share with their followers. That's that individual salvation element. 
And they all have stories about them set in human history on Earth, yet none of them ever actually existed. So if Christianity, if Jesus is the lone exception of all of these, that looks very improbable. I mean, it's, why would he be the only one who uh, fits all of these details, and yet he's the only one who happens to actually exist? This is one of the reasons why we have initial reasons to be skeptical of the story. But I want to caution you again against bad emphasis of bad, bad arguments. <laughs> they were not all born on December 25th, and I'll point out that neither was Jesus. Uh, the idea that Jesus was born on December 25th is a late addition to the religion. So whenever you hear someone trying to explain the origins of religion of Christianity by saying, yeah, they just copied a God who was born on December 25th, obviously that can't be correct because Jesus wasn't born on December 25th when the religion began. That was an addition later on. And there are many other things like this. They'll still make claims about parallels between these gods and Christianity that aren't true, and this is one of the ones that is. There were some gods who were born on December 25th, uh, but, and that's probably what infected Christianity later on. They borrowed pagan elements and brought them in, but that was a later development. It can't explain the origin of the religion. Uh, so here's the next bombshell, surprising thing. Philo of Alexandria, and he's alive the same time as Paul, same time as Jesus. Philo of Alexandria is a Jew, uh, Jewish scholar uh, in Alexandria, uh, Egypt. And he tells us this. If you want the sources, not the impossible faith, we'll give them to you with quotations and everything. He tells us that there was a pre-Christian Jewish belief in a celestial being actually named Jesus. And you know who this celestial Jesus was? He was the firstborn son of God. Philo says this point blank. He's the image of God. He's God's agent of creation. And he's God's celestial high priest. Because God had a temple in heaven as well as the earthly temple. The heavenly temple needed a priest, too, and that's this guy. He was also called the Logos. He, all these things Philo tells us. Now, it's worth pointing out that all of these things are Christian beliefs attested in the letters of Paul. So what are the odds that Paul is talking to Christians and Christians are talking to Paul about a God who exactly fits this archangel that Philo is talking about, that Jews already believed in, who is not a historical person but a celestial being? I think it's extremely unlikely. So when you look at this kind of thing, we're, we're looking at uh, a change in a pre-existing celestial deity belief. And this is what the Christians did. This is what the Christians did to change it up. And we see this in Philippians, as well as in 1 Corinthians 15, which provides some of the other details. The earliest known Christians believed, came up with the belief, that this pre-existent being descended, became incarnate, and died, and rose again then appeared to select people to tell them all this. In other words, they took some of these pagan elements, these Hellenistic trend elements, found a way to make them make sense within the Jewish system, and adapted an existing Jewish belief to create a new religion, a syncretistic religion, uh, that combined Judaism with the Hellenistic trends. On the most plausible mythicist theory, this incarnation, death, and burial took place in outer space just below the orbit of the moon. You might think, that's a crazy freaking belief. Where would that come from? Well, the same exact thing was taught about Osiris. Osiris, uh, the public stories, put him on Earth, just like Jesus, in history, just like Jesus. But private stories had his death and resurrection occur in outer space just below the moon. And you know, there's, there's, there's lots of other supporting evidence that the uh, early Jews, Christians, and pagans believed that there were all kinds of things going on in heaven, uh, all kinds of things occurring there. For example, we know that Adam is believed to have been buried in outer space. In fact, uh, I have it on good authority that he's buried somewhat near the orbit of Mars. <laughs> this is according to the revelation of Moses, which is again a pre-Christian uh, source text. And there are other, there's other evidence that there, there's dirt in, in heaven, there's dirt in outer space, uh, there's buildings there, uh, there's thrones, there's uh, uh, demons that battle up there. There's all kinds of stuff going on in outer space in this, this world. Too. So it's possible to die there and be buried there and be resurrected. And that's what happened to Osiris. Now, in Paul's authentic letters, uh, Galatians 1, he says, Brothers, the gospel I preached does not come from man. Neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Make a note of that. In 1 Corinthians, he says, Brothers, the gospel I preached is what I also received. Remember, we just told you what he received was the revelation. Not, so not, this is not oral tradition that came to him from uh, disciples or anything. This is a revelation. The gospel I preached is what I received through the revelation, like he says in Galatians. 
that according to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that according to the scriptures, he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to Kephas and various other people. He goes on a list. And at last, he appeared to me as well. And of course, appearing to me in Galatians, we know he's talking about revelations. He's not talking about physical walk uh, walking around corpse Jesus. Now, there are different ways to interpret this, but let's move on to the next point. Uh, I received from the Lord, remember what he received from the Lord is the revelation, what I also delivered to you, that on the night he was handed over, the Lord took bread and said, and he goes on to do the speech that Jesus gives in the Eucharist or the, the Last Supper. So let's look at some of these things here. Note that in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is not said to have appeared before his death. There's no mention of a ministry. There's no mention of anyone seeing him. There's no mention of anyone seeing him uh, crucified or seeing him uh, buried. No, he, the first mention of him appearing is after his death. Now, there are different ways to interpret that. Uh, the traditional interpretation and the scholarly interpretation is to assume that Paul is just assuming his readers know, oh, yes, that the people did see these things and it did, really did occur. But the text does not itself require you to read it that way. The text itself just has no appearance in it until after his death. Another key thing is that when he says according to the scriptures, the usual way to read that is in fulfillment of, that the event happened and it fulfilled the prophecy. But it, the way the Greek is written, it can also mean that's where we learned it. The scriptures told us this. In other words, he's saying, we read the scriptures that Christ died, we read in the scriptures that Christ died for our sins, etc. In other words, it looks like he's learning this information from the scriptures, and not necessarily that from uh, human witnesses, for example. Now, that you can interpret it, it can be read both ways. So it's ambiguous in regard as to which he means, but that gives you some leeway for interpreting this. And then last, notice that Paul, this, this last one, means that Paul hallucinated the Last Supper. I mean, he says it right there, I received from the Lord. We know he's talking about revelations. So he hallucinated the whole Last Supper scene and conveys something that Jesus said in that occasion through a hallucination. In other words, he's quoting a dead Jesus that didn't, he's not quoting a historical Jesus, he's quoting an imaginary Jesus in his head. Now, if you see this is going on already, you can see where we're going with this, uh, where we're gonna end up with uh, once you start putting these revelatory teachings in uh, the gospel form. So according to Paul, we also know throughout his letters, according to Paul, scripture and revelation are the only sources of information Paul ever mentions anyone having. He never mentions there being an oral tradition. He never mentions what this witness said that, this witness said the other thing. No, the only sources of information that he ever seems to know about or respect are scripture and revelation. The Jesus he knows and refers to and speaks to is always in outer space. Whenever you can tell what he's talking about, where he's putting this guy, the Jesus he knows is in outer space all the time. Uh, he never clearly places Jesus on earth or connects him to human history. There are ambiguous passages that one can read that way, but he never clearly places him that way. So that leaves the Gospels. The Gospels come decades later, after the epistles of Paul, and uh, they're the first we hear of an earthly story of Jesus. The Gospels are wildly fictitious in their content and structure. I'm sure none of you need convincing on that. Uh, there will be people who, even mainstream scholars, will debate that, but nonetheless, it's true, and I can defend it. Uh, every story in it has discernible allegorical or propagandistic intent, so there's reasons to fabricate the stories apart from trying to tell the truth. Uh, it's not really their main aim. And the first of these, the Gospel of Mark, looks like an extended meta-parable. In the Gospel of Mark itself, he says that uh, these parables will be told to the people so they don't know the truth, but in secret, I'll tell you what they really mean, what the stories really mean. And the point is that the story, the literal meaning of the story is not the meaning of the story, it's the hidden meaning of the story, that what they symbolize is the true meaning. Well, that's a covert way for Mark to tell you that that's what his whole gospel is. His whole gospel is a giant new parable. That, uh, for outsiders, they're not gonna get it, but insiders are gonna be told the truth. Uh, and we know in religions generally, this is one way that you can create insider, uh, insider, insider uh, cohesion by making the insiders think that they're special because they know the truth and outsiders don't get it. So it makes them feel better like they have the secret knowledge. Uh, and and that there's, so this kind of aspect to it uh, looks to be the way Mark is constructed. Later Gospels looks like they're trying to sell a historical Jesus. There is no other evidence. That's it. Uh, there are references to Jesus in other sources, but everything else is either not independent, in other words, they just echo the Gospels, or what Christians said the Gospels say, so that the evidence traces back to the Gospels, so we don't have any independent corroboration of them. 
or it's fabricated. Uh, there are the infancy gospels, for example, where Jesus is like this evil omen child who does these horrible things. Um, and they're very scary, by the way. If someone made a movie based literally on the infancy gospels, it would be like one of the top horror films <laughs> in the country. I, I recommend reading it. You'd be like, holy shit. <laughs> Uh, made up, completely fabricated. Um, Jesus' letter to Abgar. Did you know that Jesus wrote a letter to a king and we have it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> made up. Uh, and even in the New Testament itself, about half the epistles are forgeries. Uh, this is a mainstream view. It's not a radical view. This is pretty much the consensus view. Uh, so there are forgeries, even made up stuff in the Gospels, I mean, in the New Testament itself. And that's it. So let me give you an, an analogy here. Let me end with this. <laughs> The Roswell incident. What really happened? A guy found some sticks and tinfoil in the desert. What was said to have happened? It was debris from an alien spacecraft. What was said to have happened within just 30 years? 1947 to the late 70s, an entire flying saucer was recovered, complete with alien bodies that were autopsied by the government. That is huge, rapid, legendary development. They invented a whole flying saucer, a whole alien species, Bodies, autopsies, that's an impressive rate of legendary development. And that's in the modern era. That's with universal literacy, uh, mass media, uh, center for inquiry. I mean, <laughs> even despite all of that, that happened. Now imagine how easily something like this could happen in the first century when you don't have any of that crap. So here's the analogy if it's not obvious. The tinfoil in the desert would be analogous to the revelations of the archangel named Jesus. And the flying saucer and alien bodies would be analogous to the historical Jesus of Galilee. That's the idea. That's the theory. Now imagine if we only had the stories written by the Roswell believers from 30 years later and information derived from them and nothing else. You don't get to read anything written by CFI. You don't get to read anything that's even trying to rebut information from the skeptics. All you read is from the believers and other people quoting or, or getting information from them. Imagine that's all you had. We would not know about the tinfoil. All we would have are multiple witnesses and sources. You could say multiple sources. We have tons. We have a dozen sources reporting a flying saucer recovery and alien body autopsy, which, neither of which existed. So this is how we have to approach uh, the evidence, in my opinion, and this is the case I'm making. The standard rebuttals, I'll be quick. Number one, Christianity is different from those other religions, and Jesus is different from those other dying and rising saviors sons of God. But they are all different from each other. The differences are not the issue. Their similarities are what identify them as a trend. The differences are what identify them as syncretistic. Number two, there are elements of Paul in the Gospels that make more sense if there was a real Jesus. But in Paul, these are very few, very vague, and very debatable. Now, this is where their best evidence is for the defense of the historicity of Jesus. In fact, I think this is all they have is to try and latch on to certain passages in Paul that might suggest uh, that there was a historical Jesus. And that's where the debate really has to rage, because that's, that's all the evidence you really have. All the other evidence, I think, falls flat. And all attempts to extract such data from the Gospels fail on either facts or logic. And my book, Proving History, demonstrates that. So if you want to see the whole case made out for that, that's what's in that book. And number three, uh, lots of real historical people are unattested until generations later or not at all. So why should we expect evidence of Jesus? But those people weren't immediately worshipped as demigods about whom our earliest literature says they communicated only by revelation. So Jesus is not just like every other random preacher in, in Galilee. Uh, the evidence we would expect for this kind of person is different because he's rapidly worshipped as a demigod by hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, uh, within decades of his supposed death. And we have these sources saying that he was communicating from beyond already. That's, we don't have that for Joe Blow in Galilee. We, we only have that for Jesus. And number four, you can't invent a whole man in just one generation of storytelling. Well, if you can invent a whole flying saucer, you can invent a whole man. In fact, it's easier. I mean, Mark even invented a three-hour eclipse of the sun in which the sun went out and darkened the world for three hours. Now, think about that. That's a lot harder to get away with than inventing an obscure Galilean preacher, because certainly there's going to be people hanging around who would say, you know, I was there. I don't remember the sun going out for three hours. I'm sure I would have noticed that. <laughs> and yet no one gains said this. We have no skeptics saying, hey, you know what? That didn't happen. Although we have tons of records of, of people who would have mentioned this, by the way, had it didn't happen. 
So we know it didn't happen because we, you know it would be in the strong astronomical records and literary records, but it's not. So he got away with that. He can get away with that. I mean, that's a much more amazing, impossible claim with far more witnesses to gainsay you uh, than inventing a Galilean creature. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily Mark made up the story. I think possibly Mark is a retelling of a story that had already been made up before him. Uh, but my point is, it doesn't matter who made it up. Uh, it could be made up as easily as the Roswell flying saucer is. So, that's weird. That, that, that gets information faster than this. Oh, that's weird. Um, so you want to know, what do you, you want to read? Okay, to learn more, these are the best books. Earl Dorothy's The Jesus Puzzle, not his new one, by the way. Uh, read this one, uh, the first one. It's, it's actually better. It's shorter, it's more concise, um, uh, makes a better case, in my opinion. And Robert Price, The Christ Myth Theory and Its Problems, is a good survey of the case and the evidence and the problems with it. And Randall Helms' Gospel Fiction. Uh, Helms is not arguing for the non-existence of Jesus, but when you read this book, you're going to see the Gospels in a wholly new way. It's one of the most fundamental things. And he's not the only one that does this. It's just a good, short introduction to this kind of analysis of the Gospels. And I recommend this, Stephen Law, I just read this recently, Evidence, Miracles, and the Existence of Jesus. If you want to find that, Google it. It's on his blog. But it was published in a peer-reviewed philosophy journal. Uh, he makes some very interesting uh, philosophical point about the epistemological argument for the historicity of Jesus. But, you know, obviously, if you want to support my work and keep me going, <laughs> Uh, I recommend these books. Uh, Not the Impossible Faith well, is, is, is fun because I, I take down a Christian apologist uh, who says really stupid things, and then I, you know, so you get to see, you get the entertainment value of that evisceration. Plus, uh, I do it in the context of teaching you things about the ancient world, about the ancient context, uh, about culture and sociology and things like that, about the origins of Christianity, and it gives you a lot of information that will be useful for thinking about the mythicist theory. And then proving history, Bayes' theorem, and the quest for the historical Jesus accomplishes two things. One is I establish an epistemology of history and a methodology that can be applied to all historical fields, something that, strangely, no one has actually ever done properly before. Uh, and also I apply it specifically to the Jesus question and show what many other scholars in the field have already shown, uh, that the methods used by Jesus scholars to prove historicity are completely bankrupt. Uh, they are logically invalid and don't do what they're supposed which means the consensus in the field is based on an invalid method, and therefore it is invalid. And so we can't cite the consensus anymore. Uh, and that's an important point. And we shouldn't commit the fallacy fallacy and assume that therefore Jesus didn't exist. Uh, it, just because you're using an invalid method doesn't mean your conclusion is necessarily false. But it does mean we need to start over. We gotta pick, find a good method, which is what proving history establishes, the right method. Um, now let's look at the evidence again properly with that evidence and let, or with that method and see what we get. And that's what I'm going to do next year, and that will continue the conversation and hopefully make some progress on this issue. So 